Okay, let me just tell you, because I was not prepared for there to be so many Ant Lloyd Webber's Cinderella jokes at this pantomime, and I was laughing so hard, I thought I was going to fall out of my chair, roll into the aisle, and die. Ho, 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 my god, hey! Yes, I am going to be making that joke for the entire festive season. Why would I not? Welcome back to another festive edition of my Stagey YouTube channel. If you are seeing my face for the first time, hello! My name is Mickey Joe, and I am obsessed with all things theatre. And this is my Stagey YouTube channel, where I review the shows that I have been invited to see here in the UK, and I talk about theatre, news, and gossip, and drama happening worldwide. And I currently have the extra joy of getting to talk about festive Christmas. Christmas themed shows here in the UK, including pantomimes. So earlier this evening, I went to go and see my second pantomime of the 2022 festive season, but the first one that I'm going to be reviewing here on YouTube. This was Sleeping Beauty at the Marlow Theatre in Canterbury, a venue I visited a couple of times before to catch some touring productions, but the first time I have been to see their pantomime. Now Canterbury's pantomime, um, the cantomime, if you will, is notable this year for one reason in particular. It is the venue where Carrie Hope Fletcher, West End leading lady, alumnus of Les Mis and the original West End cast of Heathers and the Adams Family, and of course, having originated the role of Cinderella in Andrew Lloyd Webber's Cinderella, soon to be transferring to Broadway, she is making her pantomime debut as Carrie Boss, the villainess in Sleeping Beauty. And given how many of you here on my channel have been following Carrie Hope Fletcher before and since the Cinderella drama, I thought I had to come on here to tell you what it was like because I was very excited to be invited by the team at the Marlow to go and see this pantomime and have the chance to review. Now, before I talk about this one, a couple of reminders. First of all, if you enjoy today's video and you enjoy the other videos I have made on my channel and would like to see more theater reviews and videos of me reacting to musicals and talking about theater drama and other such things, make sure you are subscribed to my Stagey YouTube channel. If you really enjoy, you can use the super thanks button down below to donate a little cash tip. That very much helps me to make as many videos as I do on a regular basis. Also, you can go and find me on social media. I am at Mickey Joe Theatre on Twitter, on Instagram, and on TikTok. Now, let's talk about Sleeping Beauty at the Marlowe Theatre in Canterbury. But first, enjoy this sneak peek of the show's curtain call performance. So for my American viewers watching this channel, and I know I have about as many of you as I do British viewers, I thought I would explain just briefly a little bit of what a pantomime is. And I'm going to have some other videos coming out over the next month talking about the other pantomimes I've seen and helping to explain a little bit more about some of the tropes and features that you usually see um, because it's its own subgenre of entertainment and there are so many facets and things to it and it's been happening for so long and it's evolved so much that there's so much we could say about pantomime. But broadly, Pantomime is an inherently British uh, Christmas tradition. It didn't used to be exclusively at Christmas, but it has become this Christmas thing that you see in theatres all across the UK. And for most theatres across the UK, it actually is the single biggest earner of any of their productions. Pantomimes are traditionally fairy stories, not only things like Sleeping Beauty and Cinderella, but also Goldilocks and the Three Bears, Mother Goose, Jack and the Beanstalk, Aladdin, Dick Whittington is a really popular one. And they are known for being high camp and fun and family friendly and full of terrible puns and pantomime dames who are drag performers, not inherently queer drag performers, but drag performers nonetheless. 
Pantomime has a long and proud history of performers playing characters of the opposite gender. You have not only the Pantomime Dame characters who are played by men, but if you have Ugly Sisters in a Cinderella Pantomime, quite often they will be played by men as well. Quite often you will have princes being played by women. That's just something that happens a lot in Pantomime. Some other tropes that you tend to see is an enormous amount of audience participation. Audiences are encouraged to shout things back and there's some just standard Pantomime lines that everybody knows. You can expect for something to be happening behind your protagonist at some point. So the audience shouts, he's behind you. Another one is if anyone ever says, oh no it isn't, you have to shout back, oh yes it is. It's just camp and silly and fun, but it attracts families and kids and schools groups to the theatre in enormous numbers, not necessarily seen for the rest of the year. There's so many people in the UK who will go to the theatre to see the annual pantomime who wouldn't necessarily go to see traditional theatre shows. So I hope for anyone who is completely confused about what panto or pantomime is, that that now makes a little bit more sense. So stay tuned, I'm gonna tell you all about this particular panto. Okay, so I had a great time tonight at the Marlowe Theatre in Canterbury. Not only is it this super polished panto that seems to have become this institution at the Marlowe Theatre, but you could tell the audience had a real sense of pride in it. It really spoke to their local community, and I love when pantomime can do this, when it can not only incorporate jokes and references to the local area, which I didn't get because I'm not from whatever county that Canterbury is. Is it Sussex? I think it's Sussex. I don't even know what county I went to this evening. I don't know geography. You know that about me already. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not Mickey Joe places. But it did really seem to speak to its local community. I mean, you have a pantomime dame who has been doing it for something like 12 consecutive years. There was such a fondness for the pantomime and such a warmth from the audience, and that was really great to just be a part of. But what made this so fantastic was just how much entertainment they had crammed into it, and so much audience participation. So much. Like, I'm used to a standard level of audience participation in pantos, but there were so many things that they were adding in and saying, right, whenever we say this character's name, you have to react in this way. Whenever I come on and do this, then you you have to do this and when I come on and do that then you have to respond in this way and there was one particular line that the dame was explaining that everyone seemed to already know because they remembered it from the panto the last year that to me is amazing that this audience had retained that a whole year on and that this was clearly so special to them they had such a close relationship and a rapport with this pantomime character they haven't seen for a year that's amazing and a lot of people look down on pantomime tonight fun fact was the first preview of newsies in the west end and so many people that i know were at the first preview of newsies and a lot of people would have thought i was crazy for going to a pantomime in canterbury instead but i had the most joyous time and i don't think panto is less than i think when it can reach the audiences that it can and the young people that it can, it has the capacity to bring so many people into the theatre and entertain them in such a wonderful way. And I think it's very special and very powerful that it can do that. Every time I thought I knew what this panto was going to be in its entirety and that I sort of sussed out the scope and the scale of what it was and how much entertainment there was going to be, it pushed against the boundary of that. And it was like, oh, we're also going to pack this in. There was this number in the second act that was riotous and crazy. The music choices consistently surprised and impressed me. Just when I thought the audience participation had gotten to the most it was going to get, they ran out into the audience and they squirted us all with super soakers. And just when I thought they were only going to get the people at the front, they ran to the back and they got me in the face with a super soaker. How is that for immersive theatre? Kit Kat Club has nothing on this. You're not getting wet at the Kit Kat Club unless you sit on a front row cabaret table and someone sweats on you or you spill a wine. That would have been a less gross metaphor. So I could keep telling you how much I loved this, but I want to talk about some specifics. First of all, I want to tell you how clever the music was and why that really impressed me. So to begin with, the pantomime was starting and you have the ensemble members coming out into the audience wearing like normal casual clothes playing audience members and singing, it's the panto, it's the panto. And my brain immediately snaps and goes, wait, what is happening right now? Because they have rewritten the lyrics to We Can Do It from the producers and any pantomime that uses a song from the producers with rewritten lyrics immediately has found its way to my heart because that is like niche musical theater brilliance. The fact you're gonna use the producers. That's either like someone being incredibly stagey or trying to use an obscure melody. I mean, not that obscure, like huge Tony winning show, but like broadly 
not known to most pantomime audiences necessarily. But whether they were just trying to use that to get away with not coming up with an original melody, I don't know. But I think it was genius. I'm choosing to believe that it was a stroke of genius. And I was thoroughly impressed that they were using that for the opening number. My favorite thing is when a pantomime uses contemporary music, and even if it's kind of awkwardly shoehorned in, I kind of love how camp that is. Like, I don't want to see Aladdin and Jasmine on a carpet singing a whole new world. I want to see Aladdin and Jasmine flying on a carpet, singing, we're soaring, flying, we're breaking free from high school musical. That to me is just like, if you could do that, why would you not do that? And I give this pantomime a lot of credit because the breadth of eras that we had in this music really spoke to a broad range of generations. We had the obligatory TikTok reference moment with the pantomime dame singling out an awkward man in the audience and singing the mommy don't get, mommy's getting hurt in the body shop. I don't, I don't know the words. Someone can tell me. We also had the Eurythmics. We also had Alice Cooper, Schools Out, going into um, Baggy Trousers by Madness. Like, so many things. Oh, and, 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 Carrie Hope Fletcher's villain song was Hellfire from The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Again, just when I think I've worked out what this pantomime is going to be, they throw something like that in me for the end of Act One, and I'm like, oh, we're singing Hunchback as well? Sure, fine. So I thought that was phenomenally clever. So from a music perspective, very much impressed me. Next, I want to tell you about some of the performances. So there was somebody in this pantomime I feel like you're waiting for me to talk about. We have to discuss Carrie Hope Fletcher starring in her first pantomime. And from what I can tell on socials, from what she's said about this, she seems to be having a blast and I'm really pleased for her. Because this is very different from a lot of the stuff that she's had the chance to do before. And that struck me this evening while I was watching her performance because she seems to be having a lot of fun on stage. And I think it surprised a lot of people that she was playing a villain role instead of a princess. But to me, that makes so much more sense for her because she's far more interesting than a lot of these bland ingenue characters and she can bring so much to a villain role. And she did. I loved her characterization. I loved her self-important malevolent villainous British accent that she did the whole thing with. That's not an accent I've heard her utilize very much before. And she gave us a dance break and she gave us vocals and just being villainous and showing a whole side to herself that she hasn't really had the chance to deploy. Even when doing something darker, like moments of the Heathers that are angsty or Les Mis or even the Adams Family, she's never got to be malevolent and vicious and nefarious. And it was great to see her doing all of those things. It's clearly a big deal for the venue that she is part of their pantomime this year because there are various references about her written into the script. Not only has the character's name been made an homage to her, traditionally the character is called Carabos in this pantomime, but it has been renamed Carriboss because, you know, when the opportunity is there, you have to take it. She got another line as well when she was running across the stage doing this kind of comedy run in this circular Scooby-Doo style chase sequence when she said three years in Les Mis for this. That was fun. But we also have to talk about the Andrew Lloyd Webber's Cinderella references. So I did not expect this to get mentioned whatsoever because even though she has alluded on social media and briefly in interviews uh, to having strong feelings about the way everything went down with Cinderella. I'm not going to rehash it in this video. You can watch all of my videos on this channel about the Cinderella saga. There's a playlist. Go educate yourself on why she may have strong feelings about what went down and find out what went down for yourself. But I really wasn't expecting that to come up in pantomime, in a script that she has not necessarily had any input into. We can't necessarily attribute these references to her. It may just be the sense of humor of whoever has written this particular pantomime. But first of all, when she's giving her big villainous speech, she mentions her two velociraptors named Lloyd and Weber. And every time they are mentioned and every time they are seen, because, oh yes, there are dinosaurs in this production. You get a very distinctive Phantom of the Opera-esque chord, because of course that's what you do for that moment. That makes perfect sense. So this one is a very flimsy little reference, but essentially the other fairy, the good fairy, says Carrie Boss at one point, she's talking about her, and Carrie comes on in a cloud of smoke and says, did somebody say my name? Which is the first line from Angela Webber's Cinderella that she said in the show. It was her first line in the show when she came on as Cinderella, immediately before she would sing Bad Cinderella. I half wondered at this point if we were going to hear Bad Cinderella at any point, uh, but I didn't notice it. It may have been hidden in there somewhere, but I did not notice it. And reference number three. 
Okay, this one nearly killed me. So bear in mind at this point, we've already had the Lloyd and Webber Velociraptors being talked about a lot. Right at the end of the pantomime, when the good hero protagonists beat her and foil her wicked plan, sorry for the spoilers, but that's literally always what happens in a pantomime, they talk about how to punish the evil carry boss, and the pantomime dame says, I know, we'll make her star in another musical written by Andrew Lloyd Webber. And she falls on the floor and says, no, no, please, anything but that. At which point, I died laughing. It was, I was just so unexpected. I was shocked. And it was, it was, it was a fantastic joke that really was not for the kids in the audience or even for the casual theatre fans in the audience who would have been like, Andrew Lloyd Webber's a big deal. That should, that should be a great, that should be great for her. Why is she, why is she repulsed by the idea? So that really felt like that one was for us musical theatre fans who have been following that whole situation. But to come back to talking about her performance, I thought she was great in this. There are a couple things that I think could have been done to help her. And I think she didn't have the most engaging role when it came to talking to the audience, but you noticed with the veteran pantomime performers how much more comfortable they were adapting their parts of the script and their lines into having a rapport with the audience and responding to the audience's energy. Carrie was mostly just delivering her lines as written, and they didn't really ebb and flow with the audience response. And pantomime performances are so engaged with their audiences, you kind of have to respond to the audience's energy. And I think that's just the musical theatre background that she has. She's clearly having fun and she is giving herself over to the pantomime vibes and to the overacting of it all completely and wonderfully. I can't ask any more of her from that perspective. Occasionally where she is entering and because she's the villain, she's getting a lot of boos and sort of mixed applause because a lot of people are still there to see her and they're like, no, but we're, we're happy to see her, but also boo, because she's a villain. I think she could sometimes let her first lines breathe a little bit more and even just leave a little bit more gaps in between them. It also still feels a little bit scripted. Again, some of the veteran pantomime performers, they have this way of letting their dialogue feel improvisational, even when it isn't. And Carrie's jokes always feel like now we're getting to that part in the script. And then musically, I never really got the big belty moment that I wanted from her, or I did, but it was too fleeting. It was right at the end of act one. And this is not her fault because I feel like so many of her keys we're in a low place for her voice. I wanted all of her keys to just be a little bit higher, not crazy high because she's got like 13 shows a week. I'm not trying to ask anything unrealistic of her vocally. I just wanted her to have at least one moment that was a little bit more comfortable in her range. I felt like it was all a little bit low and we wanted that impressive Carrie Hope Fletcher belting out a song moment. That's what people would expect of her. That's what a lot of people have come to see her do, to hear her do. Also, I feel like I just wanted her to be able to sing for a more extended period of time. The first few songs that she got were like nods to songs and references to songs. She got to do like a couple lines of Sweet Dreams and a, a couple lines of, what's the song? It's like, please to meet you, hope you know my name. I feel like it's also in Moulin Rouge, whatever that song is. She kind of nodded to that one, but it was a long time before she actually got to properly sing. Now there are some other cast members in this pantomime as well who I also want to talk about. So Ore Aduba was playing the prince. He was lovely, he was charming. Vocally not perhaps the strongest that I have seen him. I saw him in the Rocky Horror Show before as well. But again, they are doing the 50 bajillion shows in the month of December, so I'm not here to tell anyone that they ought to be vocally stronger. If you are getting through a pantomime, then you're doing well to survive. But he was lovely, as was Ellie Kingdon, who was playing Princess Aurora. Neither of them had the most interesting characters in the world, with a prince and princess in panto, traditionally not the most exciting. Ben Roddy was playing the pantomime dame at Nurse Nelly and has been the dame for Canterbury 14 times, which is staggering, and so has an understandably wonderful rapport with the audience, and just nothing feminine about this performance whatsoever. Just the most brash, mannish pantomime dame, which is hilarious in all of its own ways, with all of the many, many costume changes, and just the attitude, and just fantastic delivery of lines, and topical references as well, and topical references that had changed that evening, finding a way to incorporate the score of the ongoing World Cup England versus Wales match. Really clever, really great. And just a performer who understands 
pantomime and how to play things when things go wrong because there were a few onstage mishap moments. It became hard to tell which was a scripted mishap and which was a deliberate mishap. There was a whole sequence where he and another performer were going through uh, what appears to be a Canterbury staple, which was, I think it was called the Canterbury Wheelbarrow of Pun, and pulling out all of these different uh, musical posters and making references to them and making puns around the titles. But everybody's talking about Jamie came up at the moment, it should have been Fiddler on the Roof, and I thought it was a deliberate mistake, but then it seemed, based on how they played it off, that it was an actual mistake and they were just covering it very well and making it very funny, which is exactly what you should do. And stuff can go wrong in a pantomime and it can be really funny. Jenny Dale played Fairy Moonbeam. She was very lovely, she was very funny. She got the panto energy as well. She got to duet with Carrie Hope Fletcher and the two of them together were fantastic. I loved their rapport, I loved everything that she brought to it. And she was really interesting in a fairy role, which again, not necessarily the most exciting role, but the jokes that she got to deliver and the way she got to interact with the audience was really fun and was really lovely. My standout, however, the highlight for me this evening, Max Fulham, who was playing a character called Jangles. Now he was kind of like the best friend character of the Princess Aurora. You might see Buttons fulfilling a similar role in a Cinderella pantomime. And he was so endearing. And again, another one who understands pantomime comedy implicitly, just his facial expressions and his delivery. He was fantastic. And also is an incredible ventriloquist. He had a monkey puppet with him whose name was George. And I was studying the way that he was puppeteering this thing and the way he was delivering lines and the fendriloquism was absolutely on point. I have seen nothing like it to the point that he was then planting words in the mouth of audience members that he was handing a microphone to and you just, you could not tell it for a second that he was saying these things because his mouth wasn't moving whatsoever. It was incredible, incredible ventriloquism. Also, while we're talking about cast, shout out to the Cheeky Monkeys who did crazy things with fire. I love fire on stage. I, I stopped being a discerning theatre critic and just become a caveman whenever fire happens. And I'm like, oh, yay, fire, flames. How exciting for me. So that was, that was great fun. So this is a very easy one to answer. There was so much to enjoy about the pantomime this evening. There were so many great scenes and great songs and all of the usual tropes and all of the, we'll have to do it again, then won't we, and all that stuff. But my favorite moment was in the second act, they started laying out this tarpaulin and Ben Roddy the Dame and Max, who was Jangles, and Ore, who was Prince Michael. They then did this amazing number, which was just so panto. It's basically, a slightly more modernized Elvis style take on uh, the whole, if I was not upon this stage, a blank I would be, uh, where it's just an excuse for them to, um, they sing a song saying like, I would do this job instead, uh, but just like comedy slapstick hijinks ensue. So for example, uh, Max is saying that he would be a cleaner instead and he takes this uh, cleaning duster and, and, and shoves it in unsuspecting places. And Ori is a director with a little um, uh, clipboard thing and that then clips in front of someone's crotch and it's it's a whole series of slapstick moments like that but they then have paint and they then have baking mixture and it just goes everywhere and so by the end of it they are falling over constantly and it becomes very difficult to tell what's a planned slapstick gag where they're meant to fall down and what's not because they are just falling and sliding all over the place by the end of the number and it seems completely chaotic which is exactly how those numbers are supposed to feel and the direction they're supposed to go in um, and it was just so much fun. It was an absolute riot. But I did also love the entire school sequence, just because it's not something we see as much of in pantomime. We get the fairy tale settings all of the time. So to have that school number where you had them all pretending to be school children and the pantomime dame becomes this St. Trinian's-esque uh, school teacher. And then you have Carrie Hope Fletcher coming in in disguise with like a gold baseball cap and a pram, which is, it's so wrong that it's right. And the voice that she did, pretending to be like a modern day surly teen, was just hilarious. Everything about that number I thought was great. And the songs that they put in as well, using Madness and using Alice Cooper, genius, incredibly clever. So those have been my thoughts about Sleeping Beauty at the Marlowe Theatre in Canterbury. I thought it was fantastic. Such a professional, slick, just joyous pantomime that seemed so beloved of its local community, which is exactly what pantomime should be. I could not have asked for more 
from this experience. And for anyone who's trekking out to Canterbury in whatever county it may be in, you'll find out for me. I could Google. I shan't. Because you are fans of Carrie Hope Fletcher and you are hoping to see her in this, I hope you have a wonderful time. You will certainly not be disappointed by her performance or by the entire show. It's just fantastic and has set a very high bar for the rest of the pantomimes that I will be seeing this festive season. If you want to find out about more of the pantomimes I am going to see and more about pantomime in general, make sure you're subscribed to my Stagey YouTube channel because I will be talking about more of them on here, I dare say, within the month. And thank you so much for watching today's video. If you have seen Carrie Hope Fletcher and the rest of the cast in Sleeping Beauty at the Marlow Theatre in Canterbury, let us know your thoughts in the comments section down below. And if you enjoyed listening to my review and would like to read some of the reviews that I have written online for London-based shows, click on the link in the description and sign up for an account with ShowScore. If you sign up using that link, you'll automatically be following me on there and you can use it to write reviews for yourself. How fun! Thank you so much for watching. I hope that everyone is staying safe and that you have a stagey day. For 10 more seconds, I'm Mickey Joe Theatre. Oh my god, hey. Thanks for watching. Have a stagey day. Subscribe! <laughs>